the first speaker in our series framed our conversation about the environment as a love story, a love affair with our planet. She challenged us to think about the choices we make and the actions we take as motivated by love. So I would say it's probably safe to say that all of our speakers this evening are engaged in their own love story with the earth. We will be hearing from Marcus Erickson, who is a plastic pollution, pollution researcher and environmental advocate and two environmental change makers, Emily G, who's making a repeat appearance with us this evening and Ali Basjager. So our first speaker is Marcus Erickson. Marcus is the Director of Science and Innovation at the Five Gyres Institute. He and Anna Cummins began the Five Gyres Institute with an 88-day journey from California to Hawaii on junk, a homemade raft built from 15,000 plastic bottles. Marcus has led expeditions around the world to research plastic marine pollution. He published the first global estimate of plastic pollution floating in the world's oceans. As a steadfast advocate for our waters, Marcus co-discovered plastic microbeads in the Great Lakes and led to the Federal Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015. Today, his expeditions rally young leaders in industry, science, activism, and the arts with the intention to provide science and understanding to a new generation. Marcus has authored many research studies and two books, Junk Raft, An Ocean Voyage and a Rising Tide of Activism to Fight Plastic Pollution, and My River Home. So Marcus, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, maybe you could start by telling us about how you began your love affair with the earth and in particular with her oceans and lakes and rivers and how plastic pollution became a key part of your life's work. I think like everyone, you know, that the journey to your career isn't uh, something very predictable. Things just sort of happen. Opportunities fall in your lap. And you never know when those opportunities are there. But if you're ready for them, you can, uh, uh, you can jump on them. And that's what I just, that's what I, I did. You know, throughout my life, I, um, I guess I'll start with, you know, where I grew up was in, the, in Louisiana and the deep south, just outside New Orleans. And I used to walk over to about three miles down the highway to the swamp. And I'd go climb over the levee and catch snakes and turtles, alligators all day long. When I was 15 years old, I had 11 snakes, a baby alligator and 96 turtles in a homemade pond. My mom said, just go ahead and do, do what you're doing and don't get in trouble. And, and, that, and that sort of uh, cemented my love of nature. I really enjoy just being out in the wild. And, and I still enjoy it today in, in the ocean, ocean sciences put you out in the wild if you're in the field. Um, but when I finished high school, I joined the Marine Corps. And I, where I grew up, uh, it was a very blue collar community and everyone, you either, you either got a job, you joined the military. And I joined the service and I found myself in 1991 in the Persian Gulf War. You may remember that's, that's when you saw images of all the burning oil wells. And, and that was the exact opposite of my experience of, of loving nature, I now saw the, the, the disregard of nature. And, and it really hit me hard because I remember sitting in a foxhole among those burning wells, thinking about petroleum and fossil fuels and this addiction that we have to fossil fuels and the lengths that we would go to to secure access to those those uh, energy reserves, the point of uh, engaging in a resource war. And I was a part of it. And so I went from this, 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 this very idyllic childhood living and, and, and breathing nature to now being among this, this, this destruction. But when I was in that foxhole, I made a promise to myself and actually to the Marine next to me that if, that if I survived this, I would raft the Mississippi River. I grew up in New Orleans, so the Huckleberry Finn was very much a part of my, my childhood library. So I did that 13 years later in 2003, I built a raft and I was dropped off in Lake Itasca, Minnesota. And it took me five months to drift to New Orleans and bypass that and head to the Gulf of Mexico. And it was a phenomenal cathartic experience. I reconnected with nature 
reconnected with the basic goodness of people. I had people just give me clothing, give me food, fix my raft, give me housing, just take care of me. And, and I'd lost that. And, and the intimate relationship to nature came back. I mean, I remember seeing Aurora Borealis in Tennessee. I had a, a 10 point buck jump over my raft. I watched a bald eagle die to catch a walleye way in Northern Minnesota. And those memories are still very dear, dear to me. Um, but what I also saw going down the Mississippi River, the greatest watershed on our continent was endless trails of plastic trash. I could always look left or right. I had a little small raft. It was 10 feet by, by 52 inches wide, exactly. And I could always see plastic trash. I could look to my left or right and see a styrofoam cup or a bottle cap or a, or a bottle or a Ziploc bag going by. On the bank of the river, I just saw tons of trash from people's roofing projects or, or bathroom remodeling, all this broken tile and shingles and just junk and car parts and tires. And it just struck me as, as deeply wrong. I, at that point, I knew very, very clearly what we do to get access to the raw materials to make plastics. The energy and chemistry of plastics come from fossil fuels. And I've been a resource war to, to secure access to that. I had been down the Mississippi River. So I saw how it gets to the ocean, how this trash, it's all going downhill right to the sea. And around that same time when I did my rafting voyage, I had a unique opportunity to go to Midway Atoll. And when I was there, I was there just doing bird ecology. And this is my first, first experience of plastics in 2001. And I saw hundreds of albatross skeletons on the ground with plastic trash pouring out of their chests. So I knew where it came from. I knew where it was going. And I knew where it goes and the impact that it has. And that, and that big picture perspective sort of told me that I have no other choice than to, to, to pursue this career. And I was lucky because I met some amazing people. I met Captain Charles Moore, the man that discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And uh, within a few weeks of meeting him, I had a job. I was the director of science and, and, and education. And a couple of years later, I met Anna Cummins. And I, actually, I met her in the, in the kitchen of Captain Charles Moore on his 60th birthday party. And there she was. She, she, she was wearing a white fluffy sweater. And I said, hello. And six months later, we were on a, a boat with Charlie Moore in the North Pacific Gyre. And I caught her sleeping in the, in the sails. The sails were down. It was, we were becalmed that day. And she was sleeping in the sails. And I had found some fishing net floating in the ocean uh, a few days later, uh, earlier. And I'd made a little ring. And I crawled up next to her and I asked her to marry me. And in the middle of the ocean, it was, it was February 14th. And we got engaged this six months after meeting. And we, we've been holding hands ever since. We've gone around the world. We've sailed all subtropical gyres. Uh, we've published work together. We now have an amazing team, now 10 people as of this week at the Five Gyres Institute. Um, it's been a wonderful, amazing adventure with so many good people along the way these last 12, 13 years uh, publishing research turn that research into campaigns that the science can back up. You can't argue against the science, although the last four years has been a, uh, an attempt to do so. Science is, is solid. We base our campaigns on science, and that leads to the change we want. A great example are the, are, are the plastic microbeads in consumer products. We found those in the Great Lakes back in 2013, and that led to amazing collaborations and a, and a, a federal bill. I, I want to stop there, but uh, thank you for the time to tell to tell that background story. I love that story. That your love affair with the Earth resulted in your own love affair and finding, you know, your wife, and that you share this passion together is really. I mean, it's it's really a wonderful, wonderful testimony. Um, you know, I remember as a kid, the rivers in on grew up on the East Coast. The rivers were horrifically polluted not with plastic pollution because we didn't really have plastic when I was a kid, not much of it anyway, certainly nothing like we have now, but I grew up in Washington DC and there was no recreational activity on the beautiful Potomac River.
because it was so full of industrial waste. And, you know, in my lifetime, we've seen those rivers be greened and come back to life only now to be clogged with all of this plastic that we have produced. And we have this new problem. It's not new, but it, we have recognized now that we have to address this plastic issue. So will you tell us a little bit about the difference between microbeads and nanobeads and microfibers? What are they? Where do they come from? All those, all those tiny plastic particles um, um, on the micro and nano scale. Um, when we first began looking at, at, at ocean plastics, we set a standard for one third millimeter as the lower limit. We were saying one third millimeter to five millimeters, we'll call that microplastic. And that standard still, still sticks, I'll still debate about what those lower limits should be. But generally anything less than five millimeters, we call microplastics. Anything above, then becomes meso, and then above that becomes um, a macro, the big stuff, the big giant fishing nets. But that small scale stuff, um, there are two kinds. There's the primary and the secondary. So a primary micro microplastic is, a, is something that was, that was designed to be that small. Microbeads, plastic microbeads and facial scrubs is, is a perfect example. They're also used in, in a, a, abrasive materials for like sandblasting. You'll see some use, use polymers for that. That's a designed small particle, a primary microplastics. Even some pellets, little small pellets that, that raw feedstock that plastic producers then sell that become things become, that uh, are made in plastics. Those things we call nurdles, small pellets. Those are also a, a kind of primary microplastics if they're less than five millimeters. Um, so of the secondary microplastics, that's everything else that's shredding from bigger things. They can be textiles that are, uh, that are um, 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 leaching out small fibers as they, as they degrade. Um, it can be single-use plastics. I can tell you in the, in the times I've sampled the LA River, I almost always come up with you know, a little handful of, you can see it speckled, tons of little flakes of plastic film which I'm, I'm, I'm thinking might come from plastic bags that are just shredding in, um, stuck in trees and fences uh, that are shredding with smaller particles. So any, any secondary microplastics, almost all what we find in the oceans are, are secondary microplastics. Um, now there are fibers, fibers are from textiles, but fibers also come from um, fishing gear. And they're, and they're different because often the, the polymers are different um, you can have nylon or polypropylene as, as, as line using fishing gear and ropes, whereas textiles are a whole different suite of di different kinds of polymers, different kinds of blends, combinations of, of different materials, cottons, and, and you can have poly blends. So microfibers are a whole different animal. Um, and the input from um, uh, the input of microfibers is very different from the input from fishing gear, fibers from fishing gear. Um, from, from textiles, it's almost always, it's wastewater from laundry, laundromats. On an industrial scale, <coughs> it can also be from the, the waste treatment facilities that have a hard time capturing those really, really small, small fibers that wiggle through all, all the systems for capturing them. Um, in the middle of the ocean, we don't find many textile fibers. We do find a lot of fibers from, from, from fishing nets, fishing gear and ropes that are degrading into small, um, well, I'll, often I'll call them line rather than fibers. I'm finding more and more that fibers are, are being discussed in the context of textiles, whereas bits of line are in the context of rope and, and netting. So again, microfibers or, or microplastics are those things from five millimeters down to about one, uh, about one millimeter or less. Below that is when we get into the nanoscale, really small stuff. And that's kind of the frontier of, of uh, plastic pollution right now is looking at the nanoscale because of the human health implications, ecological implications uh, for those nano size particles. Right, right. So can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, you know, we've read that microplastics, nanoplastics are everywhere. They're in our soil, in our air in the food that we eat, is, is that true? And are we really ingesting uh, plastics as part of our regular diet? Yes, we are. You know, every, every one of us is ingesting, inhaling, drinking micro 
plastics, microfibers. They're in everything that they're in everything around us. I mean, as I, I look around me, there are there's there's plastics sloughing off micro and nanoparticles all the time. Outdoors, any tarp tarp or awning is shedding microfibers. The exhaust from a laundromat is exhausting microfibers. And we breathe them. There's been evidence of microfibers, plastic microfibers in human lungs going back to the 1970s. But now in the last five years, you've seen many studies looking at, at micro and nanoscale particles inside foods and beverages. I was talking with, uh, with Scott Coffin yesterday. Um, he, he works here in California on policy work. And he's been working quite a bit in the last few years setting standards for, 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 for the quality of, of, of drinking water um, and in terms of the, the threshold for how many nano and microparticles of, of fibers are allowed. So there's a lot of attention now looking at, at, at where the microfibers are, are, are occurring, where they reside in our bodies, um, how, how they transfer from our stomach through our stomach lining into our circulatory system, uh, which organs are impacted. There's a, there's a lot of work being done now on, on where those nanoparticles, in fact, the journal just came out, just a new journal uh, about micro and nano uh, uh, plastic technologies. So we're seeing a lot of attention now of that scale. But yes, to answer your question, we're finding them everywhere in what you breathe, what you eat, and what you drink. Okay, well, that's terrifying. Um, and I think that, you know, people are very aware of plastic water bottles, plastic bags. I don't think most people are aware that we are all ingesting plastic residue or plastic smog, as you call it, um, in, your, in some of your studies and papers. You had, had taken a, a recent trip to the desert and you found uh, evidence of plastic there. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yes. So um, uh, the most recent paper that, that, that we published was maybe two months ago, uh, where, we, where we reported finding plastic bags and plastic rope in the stomachs of camels. Now, if you think of all the charismatic megafauna that have uh, been, been the poster animals for this issue, the albatross, uh, every time a whale uh, dies on the beach and you do a necropsy, you find plastic bags in their gut. Um, you've seen lots of entanglement of marine mammals. Uh, but this, and this issue has largely been an ocean issue. But if you, now we're finding on, on land, uh, ruminants like goats and Arabian oryx, uh, cows and camels and horses are, are pulling plastic bags, plastic waste, either scavenging in landfills or the pulling them off of trees and off of fences and consuming them. And I, I met, I was, in, uh, I was in Kuwait and Dubai and Qatar and Oman, those three countries, those four countries, about three years ago, uh, studying plastics in the Gulf of Arabia. And I, was, I brought my nets and I was doing my, the, my ocean surface survey and I met a veterinarian in Dubai. Uh, a man by the name of Uri, Uli Werner. And he runs the hospital in Dubai. Only, it's a hospital only for camels. And he told me, he said, you want to see, you want to see camel? You want to see plastics? Come with me. So we drove 60 miles into the desert. And I was astounded to find, you know, we're finding piles of bones, which is normal. But each one was a camel skeleton. Inside the chest cavity of each camel was a mass of plastic trash. So we pulled out five of these things. And I have one that's the size of a small suitcase. It's got to have at least 2,000 plastic bags in it inside his camel's chest for its, for, its, for its life until it perished. And it perished, I'm sure, because of that. So, so um, Dr. Uli took me back to his hospital where I saw the records. Over 300 camels have been documented with plastic trash in their gut. And, they, and the, most of these camels died on the table, died either in the hospital or found in the field. And what I learned was that when these animals are ingesting plastics, it's not a benign material that goes in one end and out the other, it resides in their gut. It can create ulcers, lacerations of the intestinal tract. 
It gives them a false sense of satiation. So they feel full when they're not, and they dehydrate, become malnourished. And the plastic bags themselves, in the folds of those bags, can harbor um, uh, bacteria, really high, high counts, uh, large colonies of bacteria, which create a very septic environment. So these camels, they're, they're suffering. It's, it's tremendous suffering for them. You can imagine if you had three or four plastic bags that were in your stomach, a dozen bottle caps, and they just sat there for months, for years. You might feel the discomfort, you might get an ulcer, you might not feel like eating anymore, and it's a slow death. So that suffering, it's unnecessary for the convenience of a plastic bag. So that's, this is another example of, of suffering caused by, by our need for the convenience of single-use plastics. And the, and the case that we make is that plastic bags really just need to go. The true cost, um, the entire life cycle of a plastic bag, there's so much harm and so much cost along the way from the, from the front end of getting the raw materials to make them and the back end, all the pollution, all the trash in communities, um, the expense to you and I as taxpayers to pull plastic bags out of trees, out of fences, out of storm drains, and then the suffering of, of other living things. All these things combined tell us that plastic bags need to go. And in fact, all single-use plastics. And we're seeing many countries around the world are banning suites of products. They're saying, okay, we're going to combine the, the polystyrene, the styrofoam cups and the straws and the bags and the, the cups and cut li cup lids. We're going to ban them all together. And we're seeing that happen successfully. The EU just did it you know, in the last couple of years. A break free from plastic has, has put out a, 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 federal, a, a federal bill, a proposal for a federal bill that would do the same thing here in the US, eliminate single use plastics. I think, I think that needs to happen globally. And that's a conversation happening right now with a, a proposal for a UN global strategy. I was just, uh, just proposed it was a few months ago by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, World Wildlife Fund, and 30 brands. And the idea is that it's, it's, it's a whole list of things uh, with banning single-use plastics worldwide as being one of the key parts of this UN global strategy. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic um, to hear that there are governments who are taking this issue seriously. You know, going back to the, the concept of a love affair with the planet, I think about the convenience of these single-use plastics. It, it would be like you have a child drowning in the ocean and you're sitting on the beach reading your book and saying, you know, it's kind of inconvenient to go over there and help them out, you know, and save them. And, and you know, we would never imagine not helping our child if we think about the earth and the planet and everything on it in that same context as one of love, then you know, you, you want to do whatever you can. So what about the corporate side of the story? You know, I think consumers are moving in the direction of saying, you know, we, we don't really need plastic. It's just that we can't get away from it. Everything comes in plastic. And, you know, we may try to shed the habit, but, when everything that you purchase either is made of plastic or packaged in plastic or has plastic components, how do we, what, what has been in your experience, the reaction of corporate industry leaders to this idea of they made the problem, they have to be responsible for figuring out how to clean it up. But before I talk about that, I just wanna acknowledge that what you said about the the love of, of nature being a, 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 a guiding sort of principle in how we approach plastic pollution. Um, I, I think the persistence of single-use plastics is, is, is completely disrespectful to other, other living beings that we allow because this convenience, we then tolerate the suffering of of hundreds of thousands, that millions of other living things that are consuming our trash. And the, and the list of animals eating our, 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 our trash is now in the thousands, thousands of species, not individuals. It's billions of individual organisms, but thousands, many thousands of species. So out of respect for, for other life, 
we need to eliminate single-use plastics. Now, so when we talk to corporations and I began working on, on this issue, I'd say going back almost 20 years now. And when I first got really deeply involved in it, working with Charlie Moore and the Algolita, uh, the Algolita Foundation, um, there was a lot of hostility that between you know, the advocates who are just beginning to talk about ocean plastics. And, and keep in mind, this has been an issue. The research has been, been there since 1972 was the first paper published on ocean plastics. Even before that, uh, plastic ingestion by, uh, by marine mammals in the 60s. We've known for a long time, but it wasn't until the late 90s when it really picked up steam. The early 2000, um, I had a chance to sort of see industry, different stakeholders, industry, uh, um, um, NGOs, the public, policymakers, and science all begin to engage on this new emerging um, uh, global issue. Now, initially, you know, industry and their trade groups like the American Chemistry Council were really reluctant to see any regulation happen. Even today, you know, regulation is a, is, a, is, is a bad word for corporations. They don't want to have any regulation whatsoever. Um, but there, has, there have been some changes. There have, have been some uh, evolving uh, of the corporate mindset. I think, I think largely due to a public outcry and policymakers demanding change. And you're seeing some very progressive organizations and political leaders saying, okay, we're going to do something and, and giving industry a seat at the table to help define what that action is. Um, so extended producer responsibility. You're seeing EPR now, you're seeing industry beginning to embrace some elements of EPR. What we're asking them to do is to bring back the, 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 the deposit on bottles, for example, um, the bounty on all, on all plastic waste, increase those, the, the rates of recycling um, by creating um, percent recycled content in new products. If, if industry is serious about, about solving this issue, I think two things need to happen. One is that the design for, for reuse and, um, and recovery, design smarter products, and then commit to using a percent of recycled goods in their products. But before any of that, we're seeing a lot of innovation around the, the reuse economy. So we're seeing reductions in the use of plastics through the reuse economy. The reuse economy simply says, we don't need throwaway stuff anymore. And you're seeing companies like, for example, Repack. Repack is creating a reusable mailer that Amazon, UPS, FedEx can use hundreds and not thousands of times. Uh, we're seeing GoBox. GoBox is a reusable to-go container, a vessel. Vessel is a reusable cup and mug that all the restaurants, all the coffee shops in one city can adopt. And that same mug can be brought back to any, any of these restaurants or coffee shops. So the reuse economy is where we're seeing a lot of innovation happening right now. And that's replacing the single use throw away mentality. But those companies still using plastics for durable goods, for example, buckets and crates and computer housings and car bumpers. Um, we're seeing that, that a circular econ economic mindset. And, and again, those two things, it's you got to design for it, which means easy dismantling of those goods. And then, and then a high uh, post-consumer re recycled content in, those, in the new products that they make. So we are seeing those things happen slowly industry is coming to the table. I've been working with a group called Soul Buffalo, uh, Dave Ford, um, on bringing uh, uh, executives out to the field, out to the middle of the ocean, to, uh, to experience it for themselves, and then among themselves talk about, about solutions with some environmental NGOs at the table. And I'm old enough to remember when I was a little kid, I lived in a circular economy, you know, the milk we got was brought to our house in jugs and the milkman took them away. When you bought a bottle of soda pop, it came in a glass bottle and you brought it back to the store and they had racks and you put it in, you got your nickel and you got your other bottles. So, you know, it, it, it's not unheard of to do these things if there's just enough will on both the consumer and the producer and push from government and NGOs 
to get it done. Um, Marcus, I really appreciate you sharing with us. I think it's time for us to move on to our next speaker. And I want all the um, webinar attendees to know that we have some questions in the chat um, and in the Q&A, and we will address those after Emily and Ali have spoken. And you can um, uh, direct them to any of our participant speakers or we can offer them up and the speakers can um, address them. So thank you for sharing all of that really amazing research and information with us. And now I want to um, give away our very first giveaway. So um, this is our first Eco Prize, and it is a copy, I believe it's a signed copy of Marcus's book, Junk Raft, which tells about his experience on his raft going from Los Angeles to Hawaii. And, you know, it also shares with how he has been fighting to solve the problem of plastic pollution and um, some of the success and challenges. And um, it is guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be a really interesting, exciting read for our winner. So we have a winner. Our winner of the signed copy of John Craft is Hugo Pachego. Hugo, congratulations. Fantastic. I know you'll enjoy it, Hugo. I'm a little jealous, um, but I know where I can get one. So, okay, so now I want to introduce, um, I want to welcome back. Our next speaker is Emily G. Emily is a change maker and social impact leader who joined us back in October when we talked about reducing our carbon impact by greening our eats. She shared with us how we can grow food from scraps and make purpose-driven, locally sourced food choices. Laura shared with me that after she heard Emily talking about food, making food from, growing food from scraps, Laura made broth from her veggie scraps and said it was better than any veggie broth she had could buy in any store. So. Um, a plug for making food from scraps. So let's see, Emily is currently the marketing communications manager at Arrow Farms. Arrow Farms is recognized as one of Fast Company's most innovative companies and Time's best inventions of 2019. Arrow Farms is a sustainably focused indoor vertical farming company that is transforming agriculture with their Dream Greens brand of baby and microgreens. Emily um, uh, served as Director of Global Programs and Co-Executive Director at Grades of Green, which is an environmental education nonprofit founded in the South Bay. Um, she will be joining us in a few minutes by Ali Busjager. Emily and Ali served together at Grades of Green as Co-Executive Directors. And um, under their tenure, the, uh, this NGO extended its reach to over half a million students globally to inspire them to care for the earth, including the two incredible teen speakers that we had at our last webinar. Now, Emily joined Marcus's Five Gyres um, Foundation on an expedition to Indonesia. So before I invite Ali to speak and give her a formal introduction, maybe Emily, you would tell us a little bit about your journey on that expedition to Indonesia. Sure. Thanks, Peggy, um, and thanks, Marcus. Uh, that story and hearing everything uh, from you is just so inspiring. So I always love hearing it um, and always makes me so excited to hear the latest research um, just to be informed for it as well. Um, yeah, so I was able to join uh, the Five Gyres expedition a few years ago to Indonesia. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to go there and see, um, to see it in action. And I brought a few pieces um, back with me that I can show um, that I, I keep just to remind myself of the journey and um, of the plastic that we found. So this is one, um, it was a contact case, a contact lens that we found um, at a beach where there was no, uh, no one was living at the, on this island. Um, we went to the beach to, uh, to pick up plastic and to see it. Um, and you can see from, I keep it um, as a reminder because 
on the side, there are the little bites from, um, from fish and just showing that it was an area where no one was, um, was living there. It's a contact case um, similar to the one I use uh, and a reminder that everything that we use uh, and do is just um, you know, does have an impact on, on what we do. Um, and I felt really lucky and, and grateful to be able to go on it. Um, but I think some of the things that I learned from that expedition was just the importance of citizen science as well and how much we can each really um, make a difference and, and also also, um, how much all of our data collectively can really help in that too. So those were some of the things that I really learned from, from the trawling expeditions and being able to be a part of it is how much um, data really can make a difference for those policy changes for advocacy and, and to lead the way um, on the front for science as well. Um, at the end, too, um, one of my favorite things that, uh, that I learned from Five Gyres is also the um, different audit ideas um, for citizen science and really practicing that STEM education, no matter where we are, if it's uh, a lake, a river, um, in our own backyard. So we'll share some of those links from Five Gyres um, that I was really inspired by at the end of this as well. Fantastic. Um, do you feel that that expedition changed you in any way? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that it's something to see the um, it, and with any citizen science, if it's you know just going out and really being able to see um, where our waste stream goes, um, and it, whether that means I know some of the the students on this call as well. Um, if it's your local. Um, MRF materials recovery facility or seeing where our waste can end up, um, I think is, is really powerful. Sometimes when we see it just in a trash can or um, even in our composter, um, really knowing the full life cycle of what happens afterward is, um, is really eye-opening. And when we are uh, you know, not in the middle of an ocean, in the middle of a dryer to see um, what's there is, uh, is, is definitely um, definitely eye-opening um, and I encourage everyone to if uh, you know to, to go out and, and do those audits and and the citizen science and and see where those outcomes are um, and to me it always helps connect back to the the why we're making those changes um, for where things are ending up. Thank you Emily for sharing that with us so now I want to um, invite Allie to join in the conversation both she and Emily are powerful voices for the environment. Um, they are going to share with us some practical tips for what we as consumers can do to live an environmentally focused plastic free life as much as possible. So now Ali Bus Yeager has worked for more than a decade with environmental nonprofits. She um, currently is the Director of Impact and Sustainability at Human IT, which is a nonprofit that refurbishes technology to redistribute to low-income communities across the US, just like Marcus was saying, um, creating a circular economy there or a reuse economy at least. Previously, Ali served as the Recycling Center Coordinator at California State University Long Beach, where she oversaw the Recycling Center. And as you heard prior to that, she was co-executive director with Emily at Grades of Green. Thank you, Peggy. I so appreciate it. Happy to be here. And um, Marcus, just so inspiring getting to hear your story and hear you speak. So thank you for um, sharing that with us. I always find it so incredible to hear what Five Gyres is up to and what you're up to. Um, so, you know, I think my, my biggest piece of advice is find a buddy, you know, Emily and I are lucky that we met through Grades of Green, we just have so much love for the organization and um, Emily is actually overseeing the advisory committee and it's so fun to get to see all the great work that the organi or organization is up to and the students so you know, I think that's the biggest tip is to find someone that you can really collaborate with and work together to challenge each other and make it fun because as you heard from Marcus, the, the situation is dire, but the only way we're going to get through it in mine and Emily's opinion is, you know, by staying curious and making a little bit of progress every day. Um, when I was at the recycling center at Cal State Long Beach, it was really interesting to see how people react to recycling and, you know, our relationship with recycling. And what I saw a lot of is what we call wish cycling, where, you know, people want things to be recyclable so bad. So they put things in the recycle bin, but unfortunately, we just don't have the right systems in place to properly recycle mixed materials. Um, 
So, you know, I think one of the best behavior changes is to start taking stock of what plastics are entering your life and your world. And Emily and I call it like a plastic audit. We had some students at Grades of Green years ago that did this trash on your back challenge where they kept a, a bag on their back and any piece of plastic they interacted with, they put it in that bag. And um, great way to lay it all out at the end of the week and see what am I using? Like, is this materials that I even need? How can I reduce this? What can be recycled? And it's that that way to make it fun and engage from a place of curiosity to figure out how you can start to make some changes. Emily, what about you? Do you have some practical tips for us um, yeah. about changes we can make or things that we can do or how to be mindful about our consumption that will um, help us become less plastics consumers and be a little kinder to our planet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as, as Ali said, um, <clears throat> uh, we love doing these audits to really assess, you know, where, where we're at and, and um, talk about different ways that we can reduce in each room. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ways to reduce uh, plastics in the kitchen. Um, I am a, I'm a foodie at heart um, and also try to uh, be mindful of how, how can we, um, you know, balance being a foodie and also um, uh, balance the amount of plastic that we're using as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the kitchen and then some of the other rooms in the house. Um, Allie is the total pro at, so I want to turn it over to her as well. Uh, but in the kitchen, some ideas that I um, brought, I live in the Mar Vista area in LA. Um, so I compost through a company comp through called Compost LA. Um, and so if you, um, you know, have a composter at, at home and you're able to compost, um, by yourself, I think that's great. Um, if you're not, there are a few options now in the South Bay and in the LA area of, of ways to be able to compost um, uh, with uh, within your home or to be able to work with a, a local community organization or maybe it's a community garden to compost. So I keep um, a, like a little um, area for my food scraps in my kitchen. And I put my food scraps in here um, to be able to reduce just what, what even could go in my trash bin. And that's what I would suggest is the first thing is making sure like what can we reduce um, before it even enters the waste stream. Um, so to me, it's anything that could be composted, make sure that it goes in uh, some sort of way to compost. Um, and something that a tip um, is even so much of what we think could potentially be composted. Like Ali said, with recycling, um, it's really hard to compost even when we think we're doing it right. So for example, if you have, um, this morning, I just had a great um, sumo or the orange tangerines. Those are in season right now and they're my absolute favorite, um, but they have a sticker on it. Uh, the sticker that you might get if you're at a store and that sticker is not compostable. So if we put that in a composter, um, even the one that, uh, that you know I'm working with, um, that would actually, not be able to be composted. So just being really mindful of anything that we're putting in the bin, making sure it's the correct bin to put it in. Um, and then same goes with what we're then putting in a recycling container. As Ali said, I mean, the regulations of what actually can be recycled is so, um, it's so stringent compared to uh, what, what we think could potentially be recycled. So I would say I brought this um, this is a soda bottle, um, and even if there's a little bit of water in it, we may think that it's uh, you know in that this is ready to be recycled. If it has a little bit of water in it, um, it's not going to be recycled, and it's going to end up you know in uh, then making that whole recycling container um, contaminated. So just making sure that everything we're putting into that bin is um, sorted out first, and then my biggest thing is making sure. Um, Laura, I'm so glad to hear you say that about the food scraps. Making sure that we can uh, reduce as much as possible what we ever put into that waste stream. So this, of course, is my example of the onion. This is what was growing today um, in my kitchen, but anything just to reuse those food scraps that we already have um, so there's less going into that waste in the, in the first place. And then I want to turn it over to Allie. Um, some of uh, my favorite tips have come from Allie of um, other rooms in the house. Allie, can you tell us about what you're doing um, for some other rooms? Sure, thank you. And um, thanks for making sure I eat well, Emily, always giving me good tips on the, the best foods that are in season. Also a, a great way to take care of the planet, eat, eat local, eat what's in season, right? Um, so one of my like ongoing rooms that I revisit every few months is the bathroom. It's, you know, probably the smallest room in most of our homes, but for me, it's where most of the tiny plastics came from. And the smaller the plastic, the more likely it is, you know, to end up in um, waterways and become those microplastics that Marcus was speaking about. So, 
you know, I really try to revisit the, the bathroom every few months and like what's filtered in, what are we bringing into our home that we can be more mindful about. Um, and we're so lucky to have some fantastic shops, you know, in the South Bay. I, I'm now in the Long Beach area. We have Bring Your Own Long Beach and in the South Bay, there's the Wasteless Shop. Uh, Stephanie was featured on another webinar, just fantastic resources to purchase some, some great items. But really a lot of it, you can just, you know, reduce and use what you have at home whenever possible versus rushing to purchase. But some of my favorite items that I've had for a really long time, I have a metal razor, an albatross razor, and I can replace the blade on it. Um, I've had this for a few years right now, right now. So replaces disposable razors. Um, I use powder toothpaste and it works great. I love it. It's still minty and wonderful, but it's just a, uh, it's a little gross. I'm sorry, but it's like a powder that you can just dip your toothbrush in. So you don't have that plastic tube. And when Marcus mentioned some of the microplastics and face washes, I learned that that's also sometimes in toothpaste. So we're like putting these things in our mouths, right? It's just crazy to think about. So um, that's toothpaste, the razor. I have a sponge that's actually made from um, a plant. So this will go in my backyard. It'll decompose, biodegrade when I'm done using it. This one's pretty new though. So that I'll get a few more months out of that. Um, so just finding different ways to slowly phase out items in your home. I'm, I'm a big believer in use what you have, you know, use it fully. If you just bought a tube of toothpaste, use it. Once it's empty, make sure you dispose of it properly so it doesn't become litter and then replace it, you know, phase it out and find something new. Um, the other area I'm getting really passionate about with my role at Human IT is, is e-waste. Um, e-waste is our world's fastest growing waste stream. There's just so much of it ending up in landfills and leaching toxic chemicals. Um, and it's a valuable commodity. So doing an audit in your home of like, what e-waste are you keeping? And if you can send it to an organization that can refurbish it, you know, like Human IT. And if you, um, do you have that e-waste and you can't get it refurbished, make sure it goes somewhere like Hyperion, like a safe center where it can be properly recycled and managed um, because there's just so many chemicals in some of those products too. So my current focus is on e-waste. <laughs> Great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I was thinking even something as simple as um, buying, if you're still eating meat, buying your meat or chicken from a local grocer who will wrap it in butcher's paper instead of in plastic containers in the grocery store. So, um, you know, there are little tiny things that we can do every day if we're just mindful about it. Um, and if you go to the dry cleaners, bring a, your own bags so they won't wrap them in plastic. That is a no brainer. They'll do that so well, so easily for you. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it just, it's just sort of being imaginative and creative, I guess, and thinking about why is this plastic? Does this need to be plastic? Along those lines, we're going to move to our next giveaway, which relates to a very significant uptick in plastic, single use plastic during this pandemic with all of the takeout um, that so many people are indulging in and doing it to keep our restaurants in business, which is important, but do they really need to give us a new set of plastic utensils every single time we have a takeout item? So our second giveaway is a set of reusable utensils that uh, come from the Wasteless Shop in Manhattan Beach. The owner of the Wasteless Shop was one of our previous speakers. So Laura, will you tell us about the lucky winner for this second giveaway, please? I'm happy to tell you that our winner is Mona Mesa. Mona, congratulations. Fantastic, congratulations, Mona. We are going to open it up now for questions that people have for our panelists. I have a bunch of them uh, myself that I want to ask. Uh, the first one, and this is something I'm gonna jump in myself. Um, so I was out walking my dog the other night with my little bag my little container of plastic poop bags, right? And I ran into a neighbor walking his dog and he said, oh, I use these dissolvable poop bags. And I said, is there such a thing as a dissolvable poop bag? And he said, oh yeah, because when it was raining or it got wet or I dropped it or whatever, it started dissolving. So my question is, does it really dissolve? Or is it just, 
decomposing down into the microplastics that we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation today. There's one company called Biobag makes a, a, a bag that is uh, compostable, like in your backyard, it's compostable. It's made of proprietary material called Matter B. Not quite sure what it is, um, but the, most of the poop bags out there are polyethylene or polypropylene, and they do not go away. You just you're just creating a a, a tomb for your poop that will last forever in landfills. So I, I don't advocate using those bags. Any of those bags, a piece of newspaper is fine. Um, there is another material called PHA. Uh, it's very different from PLA. So polylactic acid, that's your, your typical corn cup or utensil you might see at an eco event. Uh, PLA does not degrade in the environment or the marine environment or terrestrial environment. And I've seen some of those poop bags made from PLA. But PHA is, not, is new material that's out. It's not that new, but it's, it's new in terms of uh, hitting the commercial market. PHA will soon be, be making... Well, poop bags are going be made from PHA. There are a few companies doing it. PHA does degrade in your backyard compost. PHA is made from microbes. It's harvested from them to make this plastic. So to answer your question, it depends on which company is making what kind of bag. You can look on, on the bag, typically the box, and it'll say poly 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 polypropylene. If it says that, don't get it. It says PLA, don't get it. Uh, bio bag makes this one matter B. That one's, that one's good. In the future, you'll have PHA uh, poop bags. But in the interim, newspaper works fantastic. That's all I use. Thank you. I appreciate that advice because, um, you know, it's something that as a dog owner, you see them everywhere. And the other question that I have um, relates to, again, during this pandemic and necessarily so, people have to wear face masks. Uh, face coverings of some sort. And many of these face coverings are made either from uh, disposable synthetic materials or reusable synthetic materials. And um, as you were explaining earlier, Marcus, how fibers are shed from the clothing that we wear, the clothing that we wash, are we breathing in microfibers if we are wearing this over our nose and mouth, and it is made of plastic. Yes, we are, but it's a lesser of evils. You know, I'd, I'd prefer to have a mask during a pandemic than, a, than not wear one and, and, and have those risks. Right. So, so yes, you, you likely are breathing in some fibers from the disposable masks. Um, I mean, the best thing is to, is to make or use a, 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 a cotton mask. So when this pandemic first happened, I went and found a bunch of old cotton t-shirts, cut the sleeves off, and the sleeves made great masks. Um, so, so yes, to answer your question, yes, they're, they're likely shedding microfibers and you're ingesting them in such close proximity to your mouth, but it's a, it's a lesser of evils. I'd much rather not have that risk uh, from the pandemic and use the mask, uh, but, but you can make a, a, a natural fiber mask to replace the, the synthetic throwaways that we're all buying. Yes. And, and I love the idea of repurposing an old t-shirt for that, if you, know, if you can, because it works great. Uh, again, why, why create something new if you have something old that can be used and repurposed? The question about um, how consumers can find out uh, where to buy items in bulk to reduce the need for packaged items. Maybe, um, I don't know, Emily, if you have any, or Allie, if you have any leads on finding bulk items. Um, yeah, I can put, um, of course, I mean, the uh, Wasteless Shop is um, is one that uh, that is a favorite in the South Bay. I wrote down the link for TAR, um, which is a, is a grocery shop um, that uh, is on my list to visit because um, I think sometimes finding grocery items that are uh, packaged in bulk uh, can be a little bit tricky. So that's one that's, uh, that's on my list um, for the packaged dry goods. Um, and uh, great news as well. Some of these that I've seen um, uh, now during the pandemic because of the um, uh, the cleaning that's going on, you can still bring your um, your jars in or you can get jars there as well. Um, so those are a few that are my favorite and one that's on my list. Allie, what are your favorites um, in your area? 
Yeah, I, I'm lucky to live close to an Edco now, which um, has a pretty great bulk section. A lot of it is packaged because of COVID. And actually, I've now seen that most grocery stores have a bulk section. I've seen one at Lazy Acres, um, which I know is in the South Bay. Even Ralph's, like a lot of stores now will have a bulk section for even just some treats like chocolate covered raisins and things like that if you have a sweet tooth. Um, it, it's a little bit more challenging during the pandemic, I will say, to find those, those options that aren't packaged. But um, it's becoming more common and the best way to see more of that in grocery stores is to, you know, shop there and purchase it and support that so that they keep making that an option and um, bringing your own bags like but before the pandemic I would go to Ralph's and fill up on bulk on oats, um, put it in a jar and it, it was no problem right so there are ways to do it and it's just getting curious about your local grocery store. Um, another great resource, of course, is our local farmers markets. I know it's not dry goods in bulk always, but it's still, you know, carrots, veggies, unpackaged. So find your local farmers market. It's a great way to um, eat well and, and go plastic free. Do you mind if I jump in with a question? This is one of our first questions that we received, and it's another recycling question. And it must be from someone who spent a lot of time playing soccer because they have a number of soccer nets, three to five millimeter nylon netting. And um, sounds like they've been storing it, not knowing what to do with it, not wanting to put it into the landfill and not knowing how to recycle it or what would be a best way to take care of this. You know, what I found with mixed materials like that, if it's a, a funky netting, like your best bet is to use it as, as long as you can, if it's in its life cycle, get creative with it. What I've seen some people do with netting is like use it for storage in their garage and you can put other, you know, loose items, toys and games and things in it. So best bet is to reuse it as long as you can. Unfortunately, I don't know of anywhere where something like that could be recycled, those mixed materials. Um, I, I just, I personally don't know a solution to that. So when I come across things like that, it's how can you get creative and reuse it as long as possible? But Marcus, do you want to chime in? Dozens of nets in the past to make little small little boats with kids. Nets and plastic bottles make rafts with a bunch of schools. Um, but but typically, I, I don't know who recycles nylon netting. Um, I know the folks at Boreo Skateboards, they were taking nylon fishing nets in Chile and and pelletizing those and making skateboards. And they, they got so good at it that now they've entered the nylon recycling uh, as a commodity and they're making nylon pellets from old fishing nets and selling those to make things like the, the Jenga game. They've made those parts. They made car parts for BMW, I think. So, uh, so there are folks who are recycling net, nylon netting. I just Googled nylon recycling in Los Angeles and nothing came up. I would simply maybe just ask your local recycler to who is taking your gear. If you, if you just look up, lo, if you just Google local um, or local recyclers and just ask them the question, what do you do with, with nylon netting? Anyone taking nylon? Uh, but I don't see anyone in Los Angeles that does that, unfortunately. So I had another question too about um, all of the, these uh, sports fields that have taken up grass and weeds and turned them into plastic with the uh, different types of plastic turf that they're putting down. Is this a, we know this can't be good for the planet, but all of these little micro, little rubber cut up tires, whatever that they use in these sports fields, do these pose a health hazard to the kids who are playing on these fields? Uh, the tire crumb on those fields. And you know, uh, waste um, 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 that waste material from tires. That's perhaps the most ubiquitous microplastic component that we find in terrestrial streams, just coming off of roads. And then it's used. It's used as a substrate in in fields where they're using astroturf. They'll put the rubber crumb there. And and there is there are some papers that, that I found when I was investigating this earlier. Uh, looking at the off-gassing of, of some volatile compounds when sun is bearing down on a field, that those little bits of tire rubber will, will release some, some toxic compounds. I don't, don't recall exactly which ones, but there are, there are uh, quite a few research papers looking at tire crumbs specifically. Uh, I, know, I know myself, whenever, whenever I walk by a field that uh, uh, has astroturf, I'll look on the curb and I'll always find little green fibers. And now I know in LA, I see a lot of lawns being replaced with, uh, with AstroTurf. 
And, and, and the argument goes both ways. They're saving on water, uh, but it's, 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 using, it's using plastic and it's single use and you do find those little green fibers in the curb. I wouldn't do it personally. I just go to the, the whole natural lawn and just wood chips. That's when my lawn has no grass at all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most of the issues around those fields is about the tire crumb itself and the heat causing it to release some volatile compounds. If you, if you go to Google Scholar, that's what I use all the time, Google Scholar, you put in uh, 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 AstroTurf or tire crumb, you'll see all those research papers will pop up. So, um, maybe same answer here about vinyl banners, you know, customize, custom vinyl banners, mm -hmm. um, you know, businesses were using them during the pandemic and all that. And now they'd like to dispose of them properly. So um, aside from trying to reuse them creatively or um, really finding out if local recyclers, what they do with vinyl banners. So. Ali put in an option for the banners. So okay. thank you for that. Okay. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and also again, please look in the chat and in the Q and A because mm -hmm. there have been some great answers coming through there. It looks like Eric asked a great question about building materials and Marcus, thank you so much for answering that. And I, um, it looks like Sharon had a couple of questions in the chat. One is those balloons, you know, those balloons that um, we still have hanging around because we didn't know how bad they were you know, 10, 15 years ago, whatever, when we were get, given those Mylar balloons. And we understand they never go away. Um, what do we do with them? And we have, and also any ideas just to keep educating people on not using mylar um any any thoughts on that <laughs> sure, you know, i have a balloon in my daughter's room she is now at, in college she has had it since she was a baby that it it still hasn't even lost its air <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, start that. And then Emily, I'll pass it to you. I mean, my my solution with honestly any unique single use plastic that I have is, is there a creative way to use this for a longer period of time? So an idea for like little water balloons, I saw someone take them. Um, take those and like glue them to a picture frame and put some resin over it so it became like a decorative piece right so my thought is like how do I contain this so it doesn't become a one-off piece of litter and how do I make something beautiful out of it that hopefully people can enjoy for a longer period of time and like Laura it's great that you said you know it became a keepsake so at least you're keeping it for a long time um so that's kind of my my first line of defense Emily what were you going to say on that yeah, I was going to say, and um, similar to Ali, if there's any way to repurpose it, reuse it, and then for sure, just making sure that when we do, uh, when we are adding things to the waste stream, like for example, if you're going to be putting it into um, a dumpster or anything like that, that it's um, completely uh, like sealed or sealed within a dumpster so that it doesn't become, um, you know, in, into our waste stream or it's not released into the air um, and then uh, in, and then into our streams that way as well. So if we are um, putting something into the, into the bin, making sure that it's contained um, and that the lid is fully down. And, and if you're in some place where the, the, you know, the bin is full, um, I think the best thing that we can do is hold it until we get someplace where, uh, you know, where we can properly dispose of it. Just thinking about, again, where that full life cycle goes, if there's wind or an animal picks it up and, and what, where that can then end up later. So we had a couple of ideas in the chat. One is mailing it back to the companies that make it. Maybe if they get enough of it back, they'll stop making it. And Craig from Surfrider reminds us that um, release of helium filled mylar balloons has been banned in the state of California for many years. I just think there's not a lot of awareness around that because they're still sold and they are banned in the beach cities, which is fantastic. Um, but we do know that people buy them elsewhere and then they bring them to our beaches. So um, I guess when we see it, we can always uh, you know, be good citizens and try and kindly educate. So I guess that helps too. It's also, you know, a social media thing that can be put on social media, like, hey, for Valentine's Day, buy, uh, you know, hug your loved one. <laughs> you don't have to buy heart balloons or, you know, just something like that is, we can, we can reinforce it. Right. Um, so as we uh, move towards the end of our webinar, I did want to ask all three of our speakers if you could share with us a little bit about advocacy, what we can do um, 
we can control our own actions. We can try to encourage people we know to control their own actions, but how do we advocate with industry and government to try to affect some larger systemic change? I can go first on this one. Uh, to my, my one advocacy tip, I'm sure we all have so many, is um, vote with our wallet as well. You know, vote um, when we have the opportunity to vote for officials and policy changes. Um, and then every day, you know, when we're making decisions on a day-to-day -day level, we're voting with our dollar by helping those companies and supporting them. So making sure that when we can, we know the company is, um, uh, the, their practices um, and really uh, investigating and being curious about that. Um, some examples of some um, certifications that I look for is the, the B Corp certification, um, just as a way to, to uh, look for that, um, to see what then, because when you're um, with the B Corp certified, with your, when you're a B Corp certified company, um, or if you see that symbol, you can look that company up and then see what their practices are and how they're ranking on certain environmental issues as well. So I look for that symbol and then look up that company and explore it more to see if that's really where you want to vote with your, um, with your dollar. And what about, uh, what about the, uh, on the government and the public policy side? Where, where, do we, where do we roll up our sleeves and get to work? I would suggest, you know, that there is a, a, a big picture perspective of this right now. You have a, a, a global uh, strategy, a UN global treaty being debated. I think this year we're seeing a lot of momentum around that. We had uh, um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, World Wildlife Fund, to propose a UN global treaty. We had um, also CL and Gaia, a more progressive uh, perspective on a global strategy. Then just recently, the Nordic Council of Ministers produced a, a document proposing for a global strategy. So that's a conversation this year is looking at the big picture management of plastic pollution worldwide. In, 20, in, in 2022, uh, you're gonna see UNEA 5 is gonna debate uh, that, that big policy. So in the big picture, you got a lot of NGOs working uh, to influence that conversation. Um, but what can we do locally? I, I often, I often hear the question, "What can I do? What can one individual do?" And I always and I always push the 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 onus of the problem on on industry, on 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 bigger entities. So I, what I ask the individual to do is just get organized. Um, I think Craig from Surfriders on is on this uh, this, this webinar. Um, other folks from Surfrider, um, other organizations, Heal the Bay. Um, you can join Al Galita. A lot of organizations have volunteer programs. Just get organized. Because once you get together and you go to a city council, you're kind of unstoppable. Over time, you know, continuous pressure over time, we get things done. That's why California passed a statewide plastic bag ban, had over 100 cities through grassroots efforts, people organizing in groups, passed plastic bag bans in cities across the state. And then, and then Governor Brown finally said, okay, everyone has spoken and the whole state ban plastic bags. So the same thing can happen in your neck of the woods. Just get organized, find what is the issue locally, what's happening statewide, and just get involved. Yeah, I think there's a, a legislation now at the state level which um, deals with plastic single-use plastic utensils, straws, napkins, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not banning them. It simply says before they are provided to a consumer, the question has to be asked, do you want this? And do you need, you know, do you want this included in your packaging? And um, they said that in, in municipalities where they have instituted this type of a regulation, that the savings of single use plastic is phenomenal, simply by requiring it to be upon request, not even upon request. Do you want this? Yes or no? So um, I know that they, that will show up in our advocacy items. Um, yes, and you know, that. Peggy, um, you know, Ben Allen was just on the Gen Blue uh, meeting and I know this is, um, Ashley, thanks for pointing it out because I know he is working on um, legislation in California. So support of our, our wonderful, um, you know, leaders that are doing something is really important. Calling our, uh, we can, we can all, and that's about getting organized. We can make phone calls um, asking for things to be passed and put on slates. 
Right. Yes. And keeping ourselves informed, you know, what is going on? What is out there? Who are these organizations? What are they doing? How can we support them through adding our voice to what they're doing or adding our dollars to what they're doing? So um, since it is already 820, um, I think we should move on to discussing um, some of the actions that we're going to take and also to remind all of our attendees that on March 25th, we will have our sixth and final webinar in our sustainability series. Um, this we are inviting back all of our panelists from our five webinars over the course of this series. And when you register for that March 25th webinar, you will also get an email asking you, what are your burning questions? So um, March 25th will mark the end of this sustainability series, but we are anticipating starting up another series with um, the South Bay Cares Racial Justice Group. We want to focus the next set of our webinars on environmental justice. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, we feel that this is a really essential area to focus on because the populations that are most impacted by environmental issues are typically those who are impacted by social and racial justice issues as well. So this will hopefully lead us to some opportunities to make some positive change there. And now Laura will put up ways that you can educate yourself about some of the issues that we discussed today, in particular plastics, what's going on with plastics, how you can learn more about it. Um, and it's really important to become educated on these issues because then we can become advocates among our own community and the people that we interact with on a daily basis who may say, why shouldn't I use a plastic garbage bag? What's the problem with that? And then here are a set of um, ways that you can act and use your voice to be an advocate to address all the plastic in our environment here in California. We have our last giveaway. So this giveaway is um, a beautiful necklace that is made from sea glass and donated by Lori Allen of El Marie Sea Treasures. So, and Lori started walking our local beaches to rehab her ankle after an automobile accident. And at that time, she started collecting sea glass that she found along the way. And she turns this into beautiful art, like the necklace that um, some lucky attendee will be winning. She soon became a passionate advocate for our oceans, and now she collects trash as well as treasure on her walks. She is also an avid photographer who incorporates her sea glass into beautiful photographs. And um, if you notice my background on this Zoom and Laura's background, those are both um, Lori's photographs that she has taken. So. Um, Actually, Lori is on the webinar with us this evening, and maybe Lori will take a minute to tell us about what she finds and how it becomes art. We can hear you. We have your picture. I don't know why the video isn't showing, but we can hear you. Well, I had um, some show and tells I was going to show you from today, and I've loved being here and have been thinking about all the ways that I've kind of incorporated um, changing my ways um, from buying plastic sorting kinds of things for the many treasures that I found to using our glass spaghetti jars and things like that for the different colors. And um, my bag that I always wear around my neck is a hand woven mm -hmm. wool um, bag from Columbia that I put a little plastic um, back when I ate yogurt out of plastic containers, but I use it, it for it's been three years. I don't use plastic bags to hold my treasures. So that's good and pockets are great, but um, yeah, these uh, recycled gems from the sea have given me a lot of joy and it has been really uh, tough to see all of the junk in the ocean today. I picked up a handful, it was included metals and straws and those uh, dog poop bags, they're frequently out there. All the gloves people have been wearing and all of the masks. So um, I think just keep doing a little bit each day if everybody does a little, good, good policy. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Um, 
for those of you who are not the lucky winner tonight, uh, Laura has a uh, Etsy shop and also her website where you can purchase these treasures for yourself. So Laura, who is the lucky winner of the beautiful El Marie Sea Treasures? Our winner is Andrea Valcourt. So congratulations, Andrea. Yes, congratulations, Andrea. Well done. So I want to thank again our three incredible speakers for joining us this evening. This has been a very, very wonderful, informative, um, and compelling evening of things to do um, that we need to be mindful of and that we can do to try to address this problem. And I want to thank the three of you for all that you're doing on our behalf and on behalf of our beautiful planet to um, try to get this plastic problem under control. So thank you again for being here and thank you to everyone who's attended this evening and we look forward to seeing you on March 25th.